Hi, I'm Scott Jones. I'm acting director of Electronic Frontiers, Georgia. And uh, so tonight's presentation is the trouble with gunshot detection systems. Uh, we want to talk, we want to kind of back up and talk about what are gunshot detection systems in the first place. And is there really anything to be concerned about? Is there any really real problem? Uh, I mean, what we found out, we do have a gunshot detection system uh, by the name of ShotSpotter that's been installed in Atlanta. And we found out that one is being installed in Macon, Georgia. And we also found out that um, that that's being, um, that's being funded by COVID relief money. So the COVID relief money has accelerated the installation of these systems. So if there is, a, is, it, if there is an issue or a problem, we need to understand that. Um, and and uh, it does add some urgency because suddenly there's all this money flowing from the federal government and uh, really no, no real direction about what it can and can't be spent for. So um, I want to go ahead and ask our speakers to introduce themselves first. Um, let's start with Alex. You can go ahead and turn on your microphone if it's not already on and, and get it started. Um, thanks, Scott. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Cool. Um, hey, y'all. My name is Alex Ayushi and her pronouns. i um, based in Chicago. I work as a deputy campaign director at Action Center on Race and the Economy. Um, some people know us as Acre. Uh, and with that and outside of that, I'm also part of Chicago's local defund campaign and uh, Chicago's campaign to cancel our shot spotter contract. And I'll pass it over to Ale. Hey everyone, I'm Alejandro. Um, I use they, them, AIA pronouns. I'm a co-director for Lucy Parsons Labs in Chicago, and I'm also part of the uh, campaign to cancel the shots butter contract within Chicago. I'll pass it over to Jonathan. Yeah, uh, my, my name uh, is Jonathan Manis. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I am an attorney at an organization called the MacArthur Justice Center in Chicago. Uh, it's nice to be here with you all. Okay, Alex, if you could go ahead and share your screen, we can get started with the uh, presentation. Okay, so um, this presentation is a copy of a presentation that we did um, back in December called Public Safety is Not Profit. Um, and we did this as a way to introduce uh, ShotSpotter and a campaign against ShotSpotter uh, to a more like national audience of organizers. Um, so, just so y'all have some context for where these slides are coming from. Um, this agenda is the agenda that we use. We obviously will not do all of this together. Um, we're mostly going to run through uh, the first three things on this agenda. So I'll do very quick on surveillance capitalism, which I'm sure all of y'all are very familiar with. Um, Jonathan will give an overview of the research um, that's been collected and that we've been using to support our campaign in Chicago. And then um, Ale will take us through some of the things about Chicago's campaign. Um, and then hopefully we will have time for a question and answer at the end. Um, so I, I, I wanna back up a little bit and talk about how I got introduced to ShotSpotter. Uh, so I mentioned that I work at Acre um, and the focus of my work is around the relationship between policing and Wall Street. Um, which means that um, I get to do really cool work that takes a more corporate corporate angle and corporate focus um, on policing. And through research that I was doing at Acre, with this framing in mind, I came across ShotSpotter. This was maybe like a year or two ago now. Um, and we started like learning more um, and thinking about surveillance tools that police departments use like as corporations. I mean, we know that they are, but I think that this gives us like another, another target and another frame and another angle to lobby on. Um, saying that uh, shot spotter costs our city in Chicago $9 million hits, but when you say that Chicago is paying shot spotter $9 million a year, I think that hits a little harder. And so um, I think that one thing that our campaign has tried to do is, yeah, just like reinstill and like reinforce the fact that these tools that police departments are using are um, for the purpose of like their own, of like corporate profit, not for public safety, um, because things that 
like campaigns like ours are fighting for um, around defund or around abolition, those things are not profitable. But reform and uh, predictive policing and more effective policing, those things are profitable for somebody. And so um, we think it's really important to name those things and our messaging and the way that we talk about shot spotter and eventually how we talk about the gunshot detection industry as a whole. And so, uh, you know, we understand surveillance capitalism as the ways in which private human experiences are collected, computed, and sold off to private businesses um, as behavior prediction. Um, and, you know, we, I think Jonathan will talk more about how exactly shot spotter works, but that's essentially what we are seeing. Um, we're seeing gunshot detection technology do, right? There's this idea that like by installing a bunch of microphones in our neighborhoods, that it's going to like encourage people to behave better. Um, and uh, data that ShotSpotter collects on, on the sounds that it hears is, is then fed back to the police department that inspires more policing in our neighborhoods and also fed back to ShotSpotter and ShotSpotter gets to say that they like counted all of these alerts and this is why you need to sign more contracts with us. And so um, those are just some of like, I think some of the more important points that we want to make sure that we drive home when we're thinking about ShotSpotter, not just as like a tool that police departments use, but this is like a tool in the larger like toolbox of capitalism. And uh, lastly, our goal is not a better shot spotter. Um, our goal is the removal of surveillance technology um, as a whole. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Jonathan. Hi, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here in this space with you, um, able to hear and speak, hopefully be heard. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to present uh, a little bit about, um, you know, what ShotSpotter is, the problems that we've discovered through, um, uh, you know, researching what's been published and some original research that we've done, um, the coalition in Chicago and at MJC, um, and talk about some of the costs and risks of this form of police surveillance. Uh, so. Um, yeah, if you can take ahead to the next slide. So here's how here's how it works. Some, some folks may already know this, but I think it's useful just to kind of level set. So the way so shot spotters, um, uh, what it claims to do is it claims to uh, identify uh, the sound of gunfire in an area that's covered by its system and um, uh, determine the location of the gunshots and send that information directly out to police very quickly um, within a minute of the loud noise. Um, that's its that's its claim. Um, and the way this system works is that uh, the a city that uh, contracts with ShotSpotter um, tells ShotSpotter what area they want to um, surveil, what part of the city, and then ShotSpotter sends out its engineers or technicians and they install microphones, um, about 15 to 20 per square mile, so one every few blocks, um, that sort of blanket the area. Sorry, um, John, yeah, John, sure. I don't mean to interrupt. I just want to, I need to go check on 3J real quick, so I need to mute my mic and then reshare if that is okay with y'all. Sure. All right, thank you. Sorry about Okay, I'll pick it back up. So, um, so the way it works is that these, um, you can see on the on the left here, there's a picture of what these uh, devices look like. Um, there's there's two models that we're aware of. That's what they look like, and uh, the way it works is that these microphones are always listening, always recording each. Uh, device actually stores 30 hours of audio locally on the sensor um, and has some software on the, the, the sensor so that whenever there is any kind of loud, impulsive sound, any, Shots probably likes to talk about bangs, booms, and pops, anything loud, it um, sends that audio clip back to ShotSpotter's uh, computing system um, via the cell phone network. 
with some metadata. And uh, those audio clips are then processed through two algorithms, one which attempts to triangulate the location of the sound by looking at the timestamps, how long it took the sound to reach each microphone, and another one that, crucially, um, uh, purports to classify the sound as uh, gunfire, possible gunfire, something else. Um, these algorithms uh, uh, are, don't, don't work all that well. Uh, at some point over the last 10 years, ShotSpotter um, started hiring sort of call center style staff who review each audio clip and like, some visual representations of the um, alert and decide whether to trigger an alert. And it's that person, this like sort of call center staffer, um, job qualifications are, you know, basically a uh, high school diploma and some call center experience. Um, they're the ones who are actually triggering the alert and effectively dispatching police um, to go out chasing down supposed gunfire. So um, if you can go to the next slide. So here's the here's the, the, the trouble. Um, so a system like this, it's been on the market more than 20 years, you figure like they would have tested and validated it. Um, and there's really two kinds of testing and validation you need. One like basic sort of fundamental validation. In general, does the system do what it claims, distinguish gunfire from other sounds, locate it accurately? And then in a particular implementation, is it doing that? And are like these individual call center operators like reliably distinguishing gunfire from other sounds? Uh, the crazy thing is that ShotSpotter has never done that kind of testing, at least not that we know of publicly. Um, there's never been any published study testing the system against um, things like fireworks, cars backfiring, um, uh, construction noises, tires blowing out, things that like you and me uh, might confuse for the sound of gunshots. Um, so we, we, there's really no um, scientific empirical basis to judge how easily the system is fooled. Um, and there's been no independent audit of ShotSpotter system, um, apparently despite requests. So we just, there was an NBC News article recently that uh, reported that a sort of surveillance trade publication called IPVM, they're kind of, I think they style themselves like the consumer reports of like surveillance tech. And they asked ShotSpotter, can we do some testing of this? And ShotSpotter said no. So that's interesting. Um, and a couple other key points. So these human operators, call center staff, uh, they play, obviously play a crucial role because they're the ones who are getting the output of the algorithm, deciding whether to trigger the alert. They they're um, they apparently uh, are supposed to follow a, an internal classification protocol known as the quote classification continuum. Uh, ShotSpotter refuses to disclose that; it calls it a trade secret, so uh, we can't even know the protocol they use to classify things, um, which is pretty. That's not how science works. I mean. Imagine like a DNA lab that didn't tell you how they like uh, did their science. Uh, that wouldn't that wouldn't um, that wouldn't be legit. So um, and they keep that secret. Uh, the, there there was one expert who independent expert who was able to review that subject to non disclosure agreement, um, and all he was able to say publicly was like anybody who's using the system should be able to see this document because you realize how subjective the system is. Um, Another interesting uh, note, just for folks who are um, you know, nerds about technology and algorithms. Um, so this is the, the way the algorithm works is that it actually transforms the audio into like a visual depiction. And then they use like a visual machine learning algorithm to uh, try to determine, uh, uh, classify whether that visual depiction looks like a gunshot or something else. But the trouble is that the whole algorithm was trained on just subjective determinations about whether an audio clip is a gunshot or not. It's not actually trained on known gunshots, known fireworks. So the algorithm is trained just to replicate whatever errors, you know, humans listening to um, sounds and making judgment calls would make. So um, that's, that's not how you design a proper um, ML system, even if, like, it would. Um, uh, it would otherwise work. So uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, yeah, so 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 that's like the general sort of fundamental reliability. Right, reliability. Most cities that deploy ShotSpotter don't actually test the system once installed. So this is an example in Chicago. Um, Chicago didn't allow any deployment qualification testing before the server went, service went live. That what that means is that they didn't even allow, they didn't even do like test firing blanks to see whether ShotSpotter picks up actual gunshots um, or guns being fired off and um, is is triggered by those. So you know, um, let alone testing for false alerts to things like fireworks and cars backfiring. Uh, next slide. So, um, so that's like a little bit of background. So, like, what what do we find out um, just by looking at police data? So, um, you know, without actual like control testing, we can't know. ShotSpotter can't know. Nobody can know what like the true rate of false positive alerts are. But what we can know is what do police find when they show up at the location ShotSpotter sends them. So, ShotSpotter sending police out to a specific location doing so quickly and then police are going out in response. And what we found in Chicago was that um, about 90% of the time police go out and find no evidence of any gun incident at all. Um, so no shell casings, nobody armed, no, no shooting victim, no evidence of a shooting, nothing to corroborate gunfire. Um, and uh, this happens a lot. So in, in Chicago, there are more than 25,000 shot spot alerts a year. Uh, that works out to more than 60 police deployments every day where they go racing out in response to a shot spot alert and don't find anything to corroborate a gun incident. Um, they might find a person there who they stop and frisk, um, which we'll get to in a second, but um, they don't uh, find anything to corroborate a gun incident. Um, and similar numbers have, you know, have been um, found in other in other cities now. So, you know, just to give you a few examples, in Dayton, uh, a journalist there did a similar kind of uh, study, found that of all the shot spot alerts, um, uh, only about five percent led police to um, report finding evidence of any kind of crime when they arrived at the location. Less than two percent of the alerts led to um, an arrest. Uh, similar story in Houston, less than 1% of alerts led to an arrest, uh, less than 20% of shot spotter deployments led to police to record any kind of um, offense, not just gun offense, but any kind of offense when they arrived. Um, in Little Rock, Arkansas, 2,026 alerts led to only eight arrests and uh, seven suspects identified. Um, just over 10% uh, of those alerts led uh, police to record any kind of offense. So, you know, consistent across the country, the vast majority of shot spotter alerts are leading police to find nothing. Police should expect when they go out on shot spotter deployments that they're not going to find anything um, most of the time. Uh, next slide. Um, so, you may have heard the claim from ShotSpotter that they're 97% accurate. This is a marketing claim that they continue to repeat. Um, they actually commissioned a consultancy to sort of, to quote, audit this number. Um, that That's not an accuracy number. This is, a, I think, a deceptive um, and false um, marketing claim. Uh, so this stat, first of all, it's not based on actual testing of the system. You know, when they claim accuracy, it's not based on any actual empirical testing. Um, the way they get to this number is, uh, I'll explain it this way. So they start by assuming, just assuming without evidence, that every alert is uh, corresponds to an actual gunshot. So they start by assuming 100% accuracy. And then they only count something as an error if the police happen to send them a complaint about a particular alert that the police think they got wrong. So for example, if the police say, hey, we had a shooting and you missed it, and then ShotSpotter goes back and says, oh, you're right, we did, we missed it. That counts as an error. Um, and, uh, and, so, and then they subtract that from the 100%. So this is just a tally of customer complaints. This isn't an accuracy rate, um, unless we all get to uh, start from the assumption of 100% accuracy, which isn't how science works. So, um, uh, so this is a misleading stat. Um, what the data show, 
is that most of the time police go out and find nothing. And you know whether in that 90% of alerts that um, you know, the question is like, what's going on in that 90% of dead end alerts? Um, and you know it might be that some of those the police you know there was a gunshot and you know the police show up and just don't find any evidence of it you know, they, despite looking for shell casings or whatever um it seems uh very likely that a large proportion of those are just maybe they probably weren't gunshots at all but you know again without testing you can't know what we do know is that most of the time police will find nothing um next next slide So, you know, consequences, like the, the uh, important to note that like all of these like dead end deployments aren't cost free. So this, these are situations where the police are being effectively told by ShotSpotter, like you're going to a location where shots were just fired, um, be on high alert for somebody who's armed and just fired their weapon. Um, so this is creating sort of uh, uh, high intensity situations where police are on alert. Um, what the inspector general in Chicago found, um, they did a report after we published ours, they found um, thousands of shot spotter alerts that lead that led to a stop and frisk, an investigatory stop, pat down, questioning search of a person. Um, that's almost certainly an undercount because Chicago keeps terrible records. So, um, uh, uh, so oftentimes the police won't link the investigatory stop to the shot spotter alert in any way that you can get from the data. Um, sometimes they don't, I know from first hand accounts, sometimes they don't even write up the report of the investigatory stop. So um, this is almost certainly an undercount. Um, also, what police in Chicago started doing is that when they have to write up their reasons for doing a, a stop and frisk, they're starting to say things like, this person, we found this person in an area that has previously historically had a, a large number of shot spotter activations. So they're in a high shot spotter area. Um, not that they're actually responding to a shot spotter alert, but just like we have the general impression there's been lots of shot spotter alerts in this area. So shot spotter is like functioning as a sort of tech wash justification for stop and frisk just because it's installed in an area. Um, and uh, the inspector general found that um, it appears to be changing police behavior in that way. Next slide. I'm, I'm sorry. Can uh, Alex, can you can you go move ahead to the next slide? Oh, there we are. Awesome. Awesome. So. Um, so, so, uh, so thinking about how it's deployed, again, this is, you know, Chicago experience, but I think this holds true in lots of cities. Um, this on the right is a map of where all the shot spotter dispatches were um, that, that we used in our, in our study. Um, and if you go to the next slide, it will show you the racial demographics of Chicago. So basically the south and the west side you see are where the, um, uh, highest proportion of black and Latinx people live in Chicago, that's where ShotSpotter is deployed, um, basically only in those parts of town. Um, it, it, if, you, if you rank basically Chicago police districts by the proportion of um, black and Latinx people, it's the exactly the 12 districts that have the highest proportion of black and Latinx residents that are covered by ShotSpotter um, and the lowest proportion of white residents. Um, fully 80% of black Chicagoans are living under shot spotter surveillance footprint. Only 30% of white Chicagoans are. So it's pretty stark. Um, next slide. This is, this is sort of just another way to visualize the police districts. So um, on the left in blue, these are the police, the demographics of the police districts that are covered with shot spotter. Um, the red bars are the proportion of black and Latinx people in the district. And you can see how the um, city chose to deploy the system. Um, okay, next slide. So, um, so ShotSpotter has, you know, it promises to um, do a couple things. Actually, ShotSpotter is marketing, and they sort of had different justifications for like, what is the system for? Um, but I think the main point is to reduce gun violence. I think that's why um, people are looking to the system. And there's very little evidence, if any, that it does that. So 
Um, a study from Johns Hopkins University um, looked at 68 counties that had installed ShotSpot or somewhere in the county over 17 years, looked before or after ShotSpot was installed, found no difference in homicides or arrests. Um, a study from St. Louis uh, did a similar uh, uh, comparison looking at uh, areas with ShotSpotter and demographically similar areas without ShotSpotter, found no reduction in violent crimes. What it did find is like a massive increase in the number of police deployments, hunting, chasing down for chasing down gunshots because ShotSpotter just generates so many alerts. But that didn't generate any um, reduction in um, violent crimes or any increase in arrests, um, if I recall correctly. Um, ShotSpotter has made other kinds of claims for what its system is for. Sometimes they talk about, you know, this is a way to get police out into the community and, you know, improve relations with the community. That feels like a very strange justification that you, you, you want cops going, chasing down, like blazing into a, a neighborhood, um, responding to supposed gunfire as like a community policing strategy. That doesn't really add up. Uh, more recently, ShotSpotter's marketing has focused a lot on the idea that actually what ShotSpotter is about is about saving lives by getting police out to shooting victims faster, by pinpointing the location of shooting victims. Um, and getting police out faster so they can render aid. Um, you know, a few things to say about that. One is that a tiny fraction of shot spot alerts um, are actual shootings. Um, but beyond that, there have been two studies trying to look at this. One study from a hospital in Camden, another recent study, October 2021, from a hospital in Hartford, looking to see if there was any difference in patient outcomes, shooting victim outcomes, if the person was shot in a shot spotter area versus a non shot spotter area, or if the police were alerted by shot spotter to the shooting, or if they weren't, and they found no difference. Um, this re most recent Hartford study found um, no reduction in pre hospital times or transport times, um, uh, found, quote, no benefit to having shot spotter. So, this again is like I believe shot spotter trading on like an intuitive sense of how this like would work in like a perfect world, but in practice it doesn't seem to help. Um, uh, it's it's a good pitch, but it doesn't seem to be true. Uh, next next slide. So uh, just to sort of talk about the costs. Um, so the way so there's the dollars and cents uh, in Chicago. It's nine million dollars a year. It's about ninety thousand dollars per square mile. Um, I think you have to add onto that the cost of all the officer time um, um, responding to shot spotter alerts. So shot spotter isn't a system that like makes policing more efficient. It actually increases the number of police deployments without any um, uh, anything to show for it. So it's actually you know increasing the um, demand for additional police officers. Um, it leads to stop and frisk. It creates these high intensity, volatile interactions with police. Um, it also creates a risk of wrongful convictions. So in Chicago, um, a man named Michael Williams was arrested on charges of murder and held in jail for 11 months, um, largely on the strength of uh, shot spotter evidence. Um, he was accused of, uh, uh, like I said, of murder. And 11 months into his trial, or his criminal proceedings, the prosecutors um, conceded that the shot spotter evidence couldn't be used against him, wasn't reliable enough, couldn't be used, and immediately dropped the charges. So he lost, uh, he's an innocent man. Um, he didn't commit the murder. And um, he was robbed of almost a year of his life, um, contracted COVID. He's a 65 year old man with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, uh, suffered a great deal uh, because of shot spotter. Uh, There's another man named Sylvan Simmons who was prosecuted in Rochester um, after he was shot by police officers on the theory that he had shot first. The only evidence that he had shot first, as far as I understand, was um, shot spotter supposedly detecting an additional gunshot. Um, that additional gunshot was not detected in the initial shot spotter report. 
Um, it was only detected after ShotSpotter went back and apparently reanalyzed the audio twice. Um, it never found any bullet or shell casing or other evidence that he shot the police first. Um, he's now suing the Rochester police and ShotSpotter um, for putting him through that ordeal. Um, so, uh, so there's risks here about how the ShotSpotter evidence will be used in, in trials. Um, a couple other concerns. Um, ShotSpotter, uh, I mean, the whole design of the system is about um, a, a way to send police out without relying on people calling 911. And actually, one, one finding from the St. Louis study, and I think another one too, is that people actually end up calling the police less when ShotSpotter is, um, after ShotSpotter is rolled out in a neighborhood. It's kind of not clear why, but in any case, it's, um, it seems like the system is sort of cutting the community out of public safety processes. Um, and it's really training officers to follow the tech around and trust the tech rather than you know, people who are willing to call the, the police. Um, so, and then one, one, um, one last thought is, is the concern about sort of false metrics and inflated gunfire stats. So, um, ShotSpotter generates all of these alerts and that feeds back into uh, other processes that police departments use. So in Chicago, they have like a comp stat system where they are held accountable to meet certain metrics, one of which it appears is um, the number of gunshots in an area. So ShotSpot, so this, to the extent that ShotSpotter is actually just alerting to things that aren't gunfire, you have police chasing phantom metrics. Um, in Chicago, also, um, the, the shot spotter gunshot stats feed into the predictive policing system, um, which shot spotter actually owns. It used to be known as Hunch Lab. I think they call it shot spotter missions or something like that now. And so basically, shot spotter is um, generating predictions, forecasts about where crime is going to occur based on these gunshot detection. Um, uh, alerts and leading the police to deploy um, more resort, more officers into areas uh, based on the um, uh, faulty, likely faulty results of the, the shot spotter system. So um, it can basically skew the way that policing works um, and create sort of a tech tech wash justification for um, more. Uh, more policing and um, uh, forms of policing that I think a lot of folks have been organizing against around the country. So um, I'll stop there. Sorry for taking up so much time. Let me pass cool. it over to Abby. Thanks, Jonathan. Can you hear me? That, uh... Sweet. Awesome. Cool. I'm going to talk a bit about what we've been doing in Chicago thus far. Um, some of these slides uh, might be a little out of date, so I'll try to point out uh, some things that we've done after these slides are created. Um, but initially, we had three core campaign demands within the city of Chicago. Uh, so we wanted the city of Chicago and the Chicago Police Department to cancel their contract with ShotSpotter. Um, this contract that the city has at the moment can be canceled at any point in time. Uh, and we, we use that a lot in our messaging because initially what we wanted to do was we wanted to get it canceled um, in the middle of last year. And then we found out that the city had already renewed the contract without any, uh, any public comment, any sort of uh, public inquiry whatsoever the year before. Um, and uh, so that's, that's really why our, one of our first uh, goals here, one of our first demands is getting this contract canceled. Um, apart from that, we also wanted to have uh, an active divestment happen where the money that was used initially to pay for this system across various years and up until now is redirected to community uh, constructed ordinances. Uh, we have something called the Peace Book here in Chicago that was created by a lot of youth here. And um, we initially wanted the resources to get redirected to initiatives and efforts like that in order to effectively address gun violence uh, in a way that's that's community based and community centered. Um, We're explicitly abolitionists, so we also didn't want uh, any sort of police involvement whatsoever. 
Um, and then the third thing is conducting an independent audit of ShotSpotter and its impact on communities of color. Um, as Jonathan mentioned before, there hasn't been any publicly disseminated peer-reviewed study on the efficacy of ShotSpotter. Uh, these questions of you know, accuracy and efficacy um, are have been really difficult to penetrate into because the company in and of itself doesn't like showcasing um, its its own false ne negatives and false positive rates. Um, really, any sort of a, a analytical tool or device that could make this uh, easier for us to understand what's going on has been denied. And I think um, the other uh, point here too is that um, the we we've been able to see research a lot of research growing that shows it doesn't work um so we'd like to just see this independent audit uh come through and see what sort of harms have already been created in chicago um, and might need recompense in the future uh next slide cool and so this has current focus again uh this is current focus back a while ago, so it might have shifted a bit. Um, initially, we wanted to get 26 city council members to support canceling the contract with ShotSpotter. Um, at the moment, we're still working on getting more uh, camp, more city council members involved. Um, I forget exactly the number that have uh, more or less supported us. I don't know if Jonathan or Alex, you remember the number. But if you do, pop it in the chat. Uh, and we're also hoping to ensure that the funds from the contract are reinvested in these sorts of Oh, thanks, Ed. We've got 11 at the moment. Um, are reinvested into these community-driven efforts. Um, our strategy, it's been multi-pronged. We've taken different sort of actions. Um, initially, we wanted to do more base building through canvassing and political education and target wards, which is something we still do. I mean, um, at the moment, uh, this, this presentation in and of itself sort of led into some other uh, more focused presentations for various community groups that have been happening. Uh, we want to activate the base, this sort of base of pressure and move the target alderman to support our campaign. Um, but also even just beyond that, to have a, uh, to spread this political education across uh, communities that are most impacted in Chicago. Um, so they can gain this, this sort of knowledge and uh, use their own autonomy in deciding what sort of actions need to happen. Um, and finally, it's just really shifting, shifting the narrative away from the way public safety is talked about now. Uh, more or less, we've noted that the notion of public safety is this sort of um, abstract, you know, entity that is usually uh, restrained by police to mean things like, oh yeah, public safety is arresting criminals and bad guys or whatever sort of, uh, you know, notion they might be using. Um, whereas we really believe that public safety is something that needs to be determined within the level of community, um, within the level of neighborhoods that are being surveilled and so forth, in order for us to world build uh, something a little more interesting and different than this uh, rapidly expanding surveillance process here in Chicago. Um, next slide, please. And so here's some of the things that we've done. We launched in June of 2021, um, I believe. And so this, this happened um, after uh, Adam Toledo was murdered by the Chicago Police Department following a shot spotter deployment. Um, it was, you know, it was really hard to hear that sort of news. And um, I think a lot of us at the time were doing uh, organizing and movement work um, in different spaces that are related to abolition, but also started um, dipping our toes into surveillance. And when this happened, this was really just like a, a big call to action for a lot of us. Um, in July, the city revealed that the contract was renewed in December of last year. Uh, at the time, we thought that the contract was going to be up for renewal, but uh, this is what I mentioned before. It was a little, a little bit uh, uh, was sneaky, what was what happened when it got renewed uh, without any public inquiry. Um, and we had a rally in March in the neighborhood of Little Village in Chicago to honor Adam Toledo, where he's from. Um, in August, the Associated Press reported that CPD and ShotSpotter framed uh, Mr. Michael Williams for murder. Um, and Jonathan spoke about that a little earlier. And we also had a rally and mapping in the Englewood uh, neighborhood in Chicago. Um, at their SDSC, which stands for Strategic Decision Support Center, uh, that's a Chicago Police Department location where data is fed into various predictive policing algorithms and so forth. Um, after that, the uh, Office of the Inspector General released a report that corroborated um, the MacArthur Justice Center findings. In September, we introduced a resolution to host a hearing on ShotSpotter. Uh, or, sorry, a resolution was introduced to host a hearing on ShotSpotter. Uh, I made that correction really quickly because it sort of uh, happened without our involvement and mostly with the involvement of 
individuals who were uh, in city council and already very pro shot spotter. Um, but we had the opportunity to, to give public comment and to make uh, the conversation much more nuanced than they were trying to set it up to be. Um, in October, we had a people's hearing on ShotSpotter. Uh, this was done primarily digitally, um, and we were able to talk about ShotSpotter, uh, get community comments and so forth. Um, Alderman briefings on the budget amendment with uh, MacArthur Justice Center and OIG representatives. Um, an amendment to cut the contract funding was introduced, but wasn't heard by the budget committee, which is one of the uh, city council committees here. Um, and in November of last year, uh, we had the Public Safety Committee hearing and action at the chair's office, uh, which is which is actually uh, where where all of this happened. Um, I mistakenly said this happened earlier, but this is where uh, we made the conversation a little more complex. Um, and is there another slide after this? Cool. And so here are just some of the tactics we've taken. They're roughly broken up into three different categories, political education, a city council strategy, and the sort of materials and tools we've used. Um, so in terms of political education, we've done things like we've held rallies in person. We've had press engagements uh, multiple times. Um, we've been doing a lot of teach-ins within various communities here in Chicago uh, because our coalition is composed of, um, I think, over 60 endorsing groups at this point. So we've uh, been able to really work with other organizers and uh, produce materials and resources that are, are useful for uh, the people who are represented within various communities. Um, we had a people's hearing online. We've, again, done a lot of canvassing, graphics and social media campaigns and so forth. Um, not listed here, but I would probably throw it into is we've done a lot of um, Freedom of Information Acts uh, sent out, uh, countless of them, to get a lot of public records data that we can use in trying to further understand how these decisions were made at the city level um, and the implications of said decisions. Um, and in terms of city council strategy, we've done things like emailing the reported findings and data uh, on ShotSpotter from um, some of the research that was mentioned today. Uh, we've had meetings with other coalition members pretty constantly. Um, I think, uh, yeah, Alex and, and I and others like to joke that we thought this was going to be like a, a two to three month campaign. And we've been at it a little over a year now and it's <laughs> still going. Um, we've targeted emails, phones, and tweets uh, that we've strategically um, looked at. And we've also done alderman briefings during the budget season, as well as raising public comment during these committee meetings in order to uh, try to better represent the voices of ourselves and our communities um, when city council makes decisions and doesn't put an agenda out early enough. Um, and then we also had a, a series of materials and tools that we used. So we have a petition um, that constantly grows. We have a toolkit with calls to action, social media graphics, wheat pacing, flyering, you know, the whole shebang. Uh, we call email tweet templates um, that we send out every now and then when we need more engagement from the public and calls to action. Um, and most recently, too, it's not really described here, uh, but Alex alluded to this at the beginning. We've started working at the national level now, so we work with organizers that represent different regions here in the U.S. Um, and have also started seeing ShotSpotter uh, begun to be installed uh, within their communities and uh, follow these same sorts of patterns we've seen in Chicago, or at least those that are similar enough. Um, yeah, and I think that's the last slide. I'm not sure, but maybe one will surprise me. Cool, yeah, that, ignore that, that's not, <laughs> except the, the call for questions, yeah, and I see one in the chat right now uh, from Kareem, Chicago PD is in favor of this tech, I don't understand why, yeah, yeah, I mean, whether the police themselves are in favor of it is also questionable, I think, uh, I don't know if uh, anyone wants to talk about that, Jonathan or Alex. You're on mute, Jonathan, by the way. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the the police brass are certainly um, behind this. Uh, and, um, and the mayor seems to be um, behind this. I think there's, there's probably um, a question about whether sort of officers on the streets think it's worthwhile. Um, we've, folks in the coalition have done a lot of canvassing and what I heard from another member of coalition, I think, and he's here, is that um, actually in the course of canvassing, we've come across uh, maybe four or five police officers 
who we just happened to approach, and most of them have said, yeah, this doesn't work. And I think two of them actually signed um, signed on to, like, the call to cancel the contract. So um, I, I think that the um, there may be, this may be a situation where it's in the political interest of leadership to be seen to be doing something. Um, and ShotSpotter has this kind of slick marketing, like, who wouldn't want to have a system that like precisely detects gunshots and sends police out quickly? Seems like a seems like a good idea if you don't think about it too much. Um, but uh, so it's a way to seem like well we're doing something, but turns out it doesn't seem to actually help. So yeah. I, I, that's part of the dynamic. And I think if I can add on to that too, I think we've really seen this uh, growing tension um, throughout time, but maybe most recently once uh, the pandemic started in between dealing with crisis, getting it dealt with fast and trying to see that happening um, versus these different sorts of uh, primarily, you know, not off, not always, but oftentimes tech companies that have a, a claim to a solution uh, that could just be bought at an easy price. So I, I think there is that like, expectation for city council to do something and and you know these are a lot of the times these are social questions that require a, a deep understanding of the history and systemic issues and at least in chicago um rather than do that work it seems like a lot of people just want to buy software unfortunately um and kareem also had a question about what are the political political roadblocks that have gotten in the way of the campaign um yeah i mean i think uh, to to Jonathan's point a little earlier, one of the issues that I've definitely noted is how often uh, city council and ShotSpotter themselves uh, move the goalpost. So they they tend to, you know, say one thing like this is to detect gunshots, and then we will argue, well, you know, the data isn't saying that. And then a few weeks later, we'll get something. Well, you know, we'll start noticing that the argument has shifted into being like we we do this because it gets officers faster to a location where someone could have gotten shot. And when you push back against that enough, you you know those those bits of rhetoric tend to crack too. Um, when that was going on, I think a week later there was a city council meeting where the superintendent uh, superintendent David Brown of the Chicago Police Department actually said they didn't have any data showing um, how fast uh, a deployment got to its its site. And so like you know it, it's uh, it's questionable when you when you hear these arguments and then realize that the city was actually never looking at it. Um, I don't know if that totally fields your question too, and I'll open it up to Jonathan and Alex as well. Yeah, I, I think you know they'll they'll try to find anecdotes and say, oh, there was this like one case where maybe it worked. I won't give you the full picture. So um, yeah, I think I think politically, polit the political roadblocks is that um, folks, elected people in city council, the mayor, the police chief, they're all facing this kind of um, political climate where people are really concerned about gun violence um, and the perception of increase, increasing violence. Um, and uh, it's, it's that, that increases, that makes it, um, increases like the burden on folks like us to persuade them like actually, like if you really wanna address gun violence, like don't spend your money on this, spend your money on something else. Um, and, uh, and I think it's a, an easy, it's much, much easier politically for folks to say like, well, we'll, we'll just like spend money on something and, you know, it's, it feels like we're doing something. I mean, there's one sort of remarkable example in, um, Syracuse, New York, which had ShotSpotter, they were facing a really serious budget crunch and they decided, you know, the ShotSpotter system is not worth the money. So they um, stopped paying, canceled the contract. And then um, somebody challenging the mayor for re-election was like, how dare you cancel ShotSpotter? There was like a shooting last month and you've turned off ShotSpotter. You're like disarming the police. Um, and then the mayor like immediately has a press conference with the police chief and is like, we're going to be turning ShotSpotter back on and we're looking to expand it. And nowhere in this conversation is any discussion of whether ShotSpotter has actually been effective in um, addressing gun violence. Um, and you know, it, it seems like that this may be a dynamic that's occurring in Atlanta right now. So Atlanta did a pilot in 2019, I believe, with ShotSpotter, and 
concluded that it wasn't worth it. I think that they did a, um, I can drop it in the chat, I'll find it, but they did a report after the pilot and they found that over six months, ShotSpotter was linked to, I think five arrests, worked out to like $56,000 per arrest. And they decided that it was not worth the money. And now for some reason, three years later, um, it seems like they're considering um, buying back into the, the system, so. This, for what it's worth, this is also like the financial model. The idea is like it's, it's meant to be sticky. So once you sign up, there's a free trial, you sign up, whatever. Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to stop paying. It's like a subscription. Um, it's like Netflix or something. <laughs> you sign up and, and you just kind of keep it. Yeah, just uh, like this, this is Scott. Yeah. I wanted to jump in and say, to to my knowledge, it actually is active on the southwest side of town or in the west side of town. Um, so the problem is that we had a, a private payer, Georgia Power, come in and 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 pay, but of course they own they own some of the uh, the utility poles. Uh, but they paid for that. They've also paid for some of the um, the the license plate readers, the Alpers. Oh. Um, so it, it's harder to get accountability when you have a private entity paying for it. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. I, I, I think, it, I, Ali, you might know more about this than me, but I think in Chicago, um, maybe ShotSpotter and other surveillance was originally paid for through funds that didn't go through the ordinary appropriations process through like civil asset forfeiture funds. So, you know, yeah. again, any surveillance without any public input or budget process. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of the, a portion of the funds, a substantial portion, I should say, uh, come from civil asset forfeiture money here in Chicago following the uh, war on drugs. Um, and so that wasn't reported in the, uh, in the police budget uh, when these purchases were made. Uh, in fact, a lot of these purchases weren't uh, reported in the police budget ever um, because they were managed by this uh, this this sneaky little other group that no one in our committee had heard of and a few older people seem to have even heard of um, that we uh, got through FOIA. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm just reading through the chat too. A lot of a lot of good activity here. So even in our own group, Electronic Frontiers Georgia, there's a debate going on about whether whether we should try to get rid of the system or should we try to work with the company to make it better. Um, and uh, so I, we don't have really co even complete agreement within our own group. So I wonder if you can speak to you know if we if we try to make this work with them to make the system better, is that is that even ridiculous to suggest or you know, I think at some point there's going to be more regulation around how um, how police surveillance is done, and I can't think of too many regulations that wouldn't cost a vendor money. So, do you think they would put up a? Do you think they would accept willingly accept that, or do you think they would put up a fight uh, if we try to to um, put some regulation around it? Take a stab at that, at least a little bit. Uh, oh no, Alex, go ahead, please. <laughs> Um, just, just on the first, thanks, Ali. Uh, just on the first question of like, do we make it better or do we get rid of it? I think one of the issues, <laughs> one of the many issues with ShotSpotter is um, something to what Jonathan was saying. Like, ShotSpotter doesn't reduce gun violence, so it's like, even if it detected gunshots accurately, it's not preventing gunshots. So we're just again like putting more money into the system of policing um rather than putting money into like things that would serve as a social safety net and like actually reduce policing and, and i mean communities want like communities have named the things that they want in public safety yes sometimes they say police um but they also are saying we want housing quality schools like they want <laughs> health care they want like mental health care and i think that um yeah, so I mean, I think that is like my thought there. Uh, and I, I'm uh, on the regulation piece. I think I still am like, if we can get rid of it, we should get rid of it. <laughs> um, 
I, I think like we saw in New York uh, with the Post Act, like their form of regulation came in just in, like, in terms of transparency. And so all NYPD had to do was say like, these are the tools that we use and this is what they're supposed to do. And that was like regulation. Um, but I, I would also like love to hear from Ali and Jonathan what they think about that. Yeah, I mean, I fully agree. I, I don't think that this is something that can be reformed into being functional or good for people. Um, and so I think, uh, there's a there's a lot of layers there, right? Like I think that if you only focus on the tool as like some sort of an object or an artifact that exists outside of the reality that we live in, then like maybe there's a case there for making it better, but that's just not how it functions, right? Like this is a tool that's always been an extension an extension of the system of logic of incarceration. It is largely, as Jonathan showed, deployed in these um, locations that are already primarily black, brown, low income. Uh, and creates, in and of itself, creates more policing data that ends up, um, it, I guess, incentivizing other policing initiatives to constantly send more and more uh, police, more and more deployments and so forth to the same locations. Um, it ends up sticking itself into sort of the circular logic of constant incarceration. And I think um, you know, there, there has to be a big sort of a ethical and moral question that you think of when you think of technologies like this, um, what is better, right? Like what is good is, uh, I, I, I grew up in a neighborhood that had a lot of gun violence. It was something that made me scared as a kid. So I, I take this issue quite seriously. And I just don't see this sort of a tech being functionally useful because it doesn't, it doesn't, one, it's, um, it's retroactive, right? Like, like gunshots already been created. And I think in this coalition, we're interested in larger solutions that are preventative rather than retroactive um, solutions that can functionally, I guess, uh, and identify these sort of uh, more systemic uh, issues that are producing things like um, gun violence and so forth, which is largely, you know, criminogenic from things like poverty or or an increased uh, police presence in and of itself has been shown to be criminogenic as well. And I think, um, yeah. I think just at the at the end of the day, it would be sort of a, a naive sense of um, confidence that might be placed on believing that a system like this could be better without noticing all the political structures that have placed them in neighborhoods like mine to begin with, right? Like I think at the end of the day, there were incentivi incentives to do this. And while the narratives might be, you know, we did this because we want to increase public safety, I can't help. As a, as a brown person, I can't help being like, we got to control these fucking brown people, right? Let's put more tech in their neighborhoods. That's what it sounds like to me. And that's, I think, why I have an issue with uh, these sort of tech-based solutions where the solution is just, let's put some sort of monitoring system and arrest them when they got out of line and not put it anywhere else where there's wealth or whiteness. I, I don't think that that's something I would feel comfortable supporting. So I did want to mention, I mentioned it up front when we started, but I want to mention it again. Uh, we just found out in the last two weeks or so that uh, that there is an, a system also going on in Macon, Georgia. And Macon, Georgia is to the southeast, about 90 minutes southeast of Atlanta. Uh, but it is a, it is considered a separate, I guess, a separate market in terms of, you know, television and, and, and things like that. Um, uh, so it is, it is close and yet far away in a sense but we do, you know we also found out due to reporting from a local tv station that the funding is coming from uh the uh the covid relief money it's not the infrastructure bill it's the american recovery act and so what happens is all this money is raining down um on the smaller towns and there's there's no real restriction about how they can spend it and you would want to see money like that being spent on officers uh, you know, squad cars, um, uniforms, radios, just traditional stuff and, and not, not necessarily on toys that, that have, uh, you know, questionable <laughs> utilization. Um, well, it, you could say that about any surveillance tech. I mean, the, the problem is that it's, uh, and the vendors, so the vendors love all the, the free money rating from the sky, but there's no controls out there. So, right. I think that the problem is quickly shifting to being one of federal policy that you can you can get the the federal government to set standards for how 
for um, what uh, what a surveillance system should do and what it should not do. But if you're raining money down and you're not controlling how it's spent, the fastest thing that the federal government could do is just turn off the, the spigot or say that the, this can't be used for this kind of technology until we study it more. Um, but I'm sure the vendors love the money, you know, falling out of the sky, the, basically the way it is now. And Scott, earlier you mentioned too, like, did we think, do we think there would be any sort of pushback against regulation? Um, I noticed we didn't address that specifically, but I, I would personally think that that's likely because uh, ShotSpotter as an entity has retaliated to various other things that have happened. Um, they currently have a lawsuit with Vice after Vice reported on some of their misconduct. Uh, and so we, we've seen things like this uh, happen where they, what we think, right? Like I can't make this claim 100%, but it looks like they try to produce a chilling effect on news, uh, news groups that give unfavorable PR, um, among other things as well. Okay, um, if anybody else would like to ask a question, feel free to turn on your mic, feel free to turn on your camera, or just put it in the chat at this point in time. We're kind of in the open question phase by now. And Larry's got his hand raised, so. Yes, thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering if the installation of ShotSpotter is the same everywhere. In other words, uh, do they all re retain records uh, the same way? Uh, does the system pick up uh, voice sounds? within the range of their microphones, that kind of thing? Do they all, do all the systems look the same? Yeah, I can take that. So um, I think basically, yes. So the, the system that they're deploying, the microphones, the sensors, how that interfaces with their algorithms, it's always a shot. Those are shot spotter sensors. Um, so yes, um, the way that it interfaces with the, the local police's dispatch and that that may depend on what dispatch system exists in the city so like in chicago the shot spot alerts go to these um local like real-time crime intelligence rooms strategic decision support centers what they're called that are in each police district and um and they send the police officers out in some cities i think it just goes directly out to police officers on like smartphones or um computers in their cars so that 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 interface I think varies depending on the police department in terms of like the listening and recording um, that again I think is uniform each sensor is recording 30 hours if you're interested in like the privacy side of things um, yes. there, there was an audit done by the policing project um, at NYU where they examined this sort of data retention um, practices of ShotSpotter, and my impression is that ShotSpotter doesn't want to be in the audio surveillance of voices market, <laughs> so they want to run away from that, that they've gotten significant criticism about the idea that they're basically wiring up neighborhoods for, um, with microphones for audio, that could be used as like audio surveillance, and they want to focus on the use of their system to detect gunshots. Um, that said, um, there have been a couple of cases where voices were picked up on sensors and were, were used in trials. In those cases, it was because the voices were um, close to the sensor and also within just a few seconds of the supposed gunshot. So it's like in, this, in the time period before and after, so it's part of the audio clip. Um, I'm not aware of any cases where police have tried to pull some of that 30 hours of data off of a sensor to hear the actual what was spoken, but um, they, they certainly could. You know, ShotSpotter can go and pull that audio off of their sensors um, if, uh, if police demand it. Um, it would be a question of what kind of they need a court order or a subpoena or a warrant or something, but yeah. 
hopefully that's helpful. Uh, uh, follow up. Uh, so that would mean that uh, a retained conversation could be used by the police to go back with a warrant, even though they had no original suspicion. Well, so the the, the way it, I think it's it's theoretically possible, but the 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 way that the system works is that police don't have access to the audio like by default or through a portal. The audio just stays on the sensor unless it's a loud pop or bang or boom or whatever, which automatically gets sent out to ShotSpotter, or if ShotSpotter reaches out essentially to the sensor and pulls pulls the audio off if the police make a request after the fact. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of a situation where the police have done that, basically called up ShotSpotter and said, hey, we think something went down on this corner where do you have any audio so we can hear people talking? I don't know that happening. Um, it, it's theoretically possible. It also has occurred to me that if somebody, you know, happens to live in like an apartment building, like right next to a sensor or something, um, are they inadvertently being, uh, you know, eavesdropped? Um, uh, you know, when they're on their balcony or something. Um, that certainly could be happening. But again, not aware of any examples. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a Fourth Amendment issue here that really hasn't been tested in court. But the problem is that the Fourth Amendment doesn't really apply to private parties. It only applies to the government. But then you have the, the surveillance vendors that are acting uh, kind of as an arm or an extension of the government. And so it's it's one thing if you're, I mean, it's one thing if you're driving a delivery truck and you happen to see crime and you report it and that you're acting as a commercial entity, but you just, it, it's sort of an incidental reporting. And then there's, it's another thing when you're kind of joined at the hip with the police and you've got a data terminal right in the police station and, and maybe right in the fusion center. And so we get into a cycle where it's search warrant, search again kind of situation where the first search is being done by a private party, but they're so deeply connected with the police that it's kind of a bypass of the Fourth Amendment. And I, I don't think this has really been tested in court, but that's essentially where the problem is. Um, and I see that Chuck has his hand raised. Do you wanna, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, I, I just did that because I wanted to jump in at some point. Uh, I wanted to just mention, uh, in kind of reply to what uh, Larry had said, uh, in a more, to the average person, to somebody on the street that we would be speaking to, I think the impression that the technology provides is that you, you, when you understand that it's on all the time, but it's waiting to be signaled by a loud boom or a pop or something like that. And that's the kind of the indicator of what will let them know that they need to analyze something. It, it reminds me of being at the city council uh, a few years ago with Scott when we were listening to them talk about body cam footage and whether, whether the microphone and the camera was on or off. And you should have seen the average city council person, the average human, listening to the explanation of that, well, it's technically always on, but we don't actually know what this is and explaining that they can only retrieve 20 seconds before something happens that it you weren't supposed to have known that it had happened because it wasn't recording except that it's always on and it is really that confusing and uh, for me what is most concerning is the fact that whether you know they can actually extract that and use it uh, somehow it I'm more concerned about the fact that the sensors are there and that they will be fed through a fusion center and we don't really know how that's retained and whether it will, can be used in the future in some way, um, like Alexa, exactly as Kareem is saying. And so because we don't really have any understanding of what people are going to be doing with that 
stored information. I mean, it's electrons, I guess, is the way people describe it. It doesn't take up space, so you can just store and store and store and store. What will the algorithms of the future be looking at and listening to because of this stored nothingness that was supposed to be nothing? That's how I, as an average person, look at it, and that's why I, I don't like it, and I don't want it there because I don't think we need to have sensors everywhere, and I have lived in an apartment, and I don't want to be on my balcony and have that exact scenario that Jonathan mentioned happen to me. Yeah, and I mean, to your point, Chuck, it, it sounds like I, I always get the sense that when data is collected in that way, um, and it's used to profit these entities, these private parties in particular, it's uh, it feels kind of shitty, you know, like, at the end of the day, it's you are sort of producing this uh, valuable product, which is your data, and without any sort of a uh, real form of consent over using it. It's just used to profit these sorts of systems. So it um, it sucks reflecting and seeing that like this data or, or these systems can remain active and produce almost print out money off of stuff that in you know in a sense really belongs to you or is yours. Well, you're right. We don't know who uh, who retains what for how long, but we do know that supercomputing exists and that saving whatever data is there is no problem for the human race at this point. And it's a matter of what would you do with it uh, at a later time. And uh, the unintended consequences after the fact uh, are not the kind that we need to get too involved in without thinking about it ahead of time. Thanks okay. for letting me participate. <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. Um, Keith, you had a comment? Yeah, I'm looking at this from an engineering perspective. If I've heard multiple constraints, one is uh, the technology isn't trained on actual gunshots, it doesn't actually work, has lots of false positives, there's Fourth Amendment concerns with the way it records audio, where it's deployed uh, is along racial lines, partially that's also, what they're going to come back with on that is they're going to say, that's where statistically the crime is, and we have a limited budget to where we can put it. Um, there's also the concern of, hey, this, this system's expensive for what they're getting, and there, it doesn't, it does deal with responding to crime, but it doesn't do anything to work on the social issues that result in crime. So it, how is there some way we can do both? Well, looking at this as an engineering problem, if I as, as, as make a supposition that we could invent the perfect AI that can get five nines accuracy of gunshots, did not record speech audio at all, and didn't save it anywhere, so it's not possible for the government to use it in some nefarious way, and it met all the Fourth Amendment requirements, the system was deployed ubiquitously regardless of uh, population in the area or crime rates. It was just everywhere. And its cost was free. So it doesn't impact on spending money elsewhere. Would that, in fact, be something that we would want? Would it actually produce the results that the, that the shot spotter system is supposedly intended to do, which is notifies the police when there's a gunshot accurately so they can respond quickly. And if there's an the event that there's people that are injured, they can respond to them. Well, that's actually, even if all of that's stipulated, that's still a maybe, we're not sure. And the other problem with the, with their argument with ShotSpotter is when it comes to that perfect system, the AI that's five nines, does, meets all the fourth within requirements, it's inexpensive, it's ubiquitous because it's in, inexpensive, that's waving a technological magical wand because that can't actually be achieved, not yet. and. It's potentially it could. Um, I've not seen any research papers at any of the universities yet on uh, shot spotter technology, that, uh, not just shot spotter technology, but the whole idea of machine learning to detect gunshots. That's questionable um, as to whether that can even be done accurately. Uh, I know that from doing Wi-Fi analysis, which Wi-Fi, by the way, reflects off buildings, reflects off trucks going down the street, just like audio does, makes direction finding what's called fox and hound of Wi-Fi access points at conferences in downtown Atlanta virtually impossible. 
even with direction, highly directional antennas because of reflections off of buildings. So there's, there's some question as to certain environments to whether it's even possible to do this given a magic technical wand of good AI that can recognize it, that could even triangulate properly. So given all of that, and then throwing into the mix that what ShotSpotter is vending is none of that. It's a non-starter. They, they've, they've also, their lips are moving their line. So when I take all of that into account, my take on it is, no, that technology is, is not ready for prime time because it doesn't meet that, that requirement. And it's robbing money from where else it could be spent better. And I don't, I'm not willing to help them. Now, if they want to contract me as an engineer to help them re review and make their product better, fine. But I'm not willing to do their homework for them for free. Sorry. Uh, a lot of, I, I, a lot of great points there. I thought that was really um, useful. I mean, in terms of like the physics of it, you're right. Like the, the, um, you know, sound propagates in complicated ways that depends on reflections on buildings. Apparently depends on like the temperature of the air, which affects the speed at which sound propagates. Wind can affect um, the uh, speed at which the sound propagates. It's, um, uh, you know, it's like a complicated business. So uh, I think that there's like questions about the fundamental reliability of the, the methods for triangulation as well as, you know, distinguishing whether something is a gunshot or not um, in the first place. So uh, yeah, all those points are really well taken. And I guess another thing to think of is it's at like a fundamental level, even in a perfect world, this is a system that is at best getting police out to the location where a gunshot was fired some minutes after it occurred. And, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out how you um, avoid getting caught by police where you fired a gunshot, like you leave <laughs> quickly. <laughs> so, 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 you know, um, like, uh, even if it were magic and 100% accurate and stuff, I don't know that it would actually be a very effective um, so, uh, and the, you know, the proofs in the, look, ShotSpotter has been marketing the system and tweaking the engineering for 20 years. Um, and yet the data on the ground consistently shows that police find no evidence of a gunshot somewhere between five and 20% of the time, or, sorry, somewhere between 95 and 80% of the time, um, when they arrive at the scene. So. You know. uh, Kareem had a couple of questions that are back in the chat. They've scrolled away, but um, here's one. Have the feds used any shot spotter data from a local law enforcement entity in their investigation? Yeah, they, they, they have. It, it doesn't, it comes up sometimes. It um, doesn't seem like it's that frequent, but um, they, uh, they have. I, I put in the chat a case, it's called Rickman, that went up to the Seventh Circuit. And in that case, the person, I believe the person was stopped after a shot spotter alert. And the case kind of discusses briefly, like, the status of the shot spotter, like how, how to treat the shot spotter alert for Fourth Amendment purposes. It doesn't analyze in much depth, but basically says, like, Maybe we should treat this like an anonymous tip. We can't really tell if it's reliable or not. That's the analogy that they made in the Fourth Amendment context. If you're interested in that, like in the connection to stop and frisk in the Fourth Amendment, we published, um, published, we filed an amicus brief, basically arguing that shot spot alerts aren't sufficiently reliable to justify police stops, and also that the information that a shot spot alert generates um, isn't specific, isn't specific enough to a person to um, establish grounds to stop a person. So, um, so in the absence of like other facts that the police officer encounters at the location that they are sent out to, 
um, we shouldn't be stopping people in response to shot spot alerts. And I can drop a, a link to that in the chat if you're curious. Um, we made an analogy to police uh, 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 police dogs that sniff for drugs. So for police to use dogs that sniff for drugs, they have to actually like do a training program with the dogs and show that the dogs are generally reliable um, to some standard uh, in a controlled environment. There's no analogous testing of shot spotter, um, at least none that's been published. So, uh, so we thought we think that's fatal to using it as basis for a Fourth Amendment search. Yeah, I wanted to ask, are there any more questions? I think we're getting close to time. Um, I'm going to need to stop the recording pretty soon, and but we can still hang out for, for casual chat. Uh, any, any, any last or final questions? OK. Uh, seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and start uh wrapping up uh i want a um, huge thanks to ali jonathan and alex for this uh what's really changed in this fight is that now the activists in different cities are starting to talk to each other um and starting to coordinate more and that just wasn't happening every, every city was a was a kind of a tower unto itself and so now that we're connecting we're able to connect uh, I think we've been able to connect for a long time, but but we may actually have COVID to, to thank for kind of getting our things together, getting us together in a, in a sense because we haven't been able to meet people locally as well. But since we're um, since we're meeting on online, we're able to jump over geography more easily. So uh, that's actually helped in a way for us to be able to get together from different cities. So it's a, it's sort of a blessing in disguise, I guess, in a sense. Um, but yeah, I, I really want to thank everybody who's attended tonight. Uh, we don't normally have weekly meetings, but we will actually have another meeting in a week to talk about state legislation and two bills in particular that look like they're, um, going to be, uh, regulating social media, uh, at the state level. Um, they would regulate much more than social media, but I think they were inspired by social media and they were inspired by regulating, uh, big tech companies. So we'll talk about that uh, next week. It'll actually be the same URL, same uh, day of the week, Wednesday, and same time, 7 Eastern. Um, so I want to thank everybody who's, uh, who's uh, come into this tonight. And thanks for sharing your concerns. And I'm sure this is just the beginning of the conversation, and it's kind of ongoing. I'm going to go ahead and uh, shut down the stream and, and the recording. And once the re you see that the recording stopped, we can start the um, we can start the more casual participation, uh, but th uh, once again, thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.